Thank you everyone for coming out. Generally, some specific piece of technology has some great detail, which is what you want. Know, you have to dig into, you know, very curious, you know, how we're doing some sort of distributed load balancing, which we're going to do with here, how we're doing some sort of trust technology, and some sort of that. But the, the question always arose, okay, well, that's, that's neat, and I can think of ways that I can apply that into the, some of the stuff that I'm doing at work, but how is it, what's the, what's the context in which all this runs on? specific business metrics. How can we make an argument to upper management that, yeah, we should, you're, you know, Mr. CIO, you should, you should invest money in all the work and effort that it's going to take us to be able to migrate our systems from where they are today into this entirely different model. And here's the different performance indicators that you could use to really measure the value that you're getting out of that. And then that's something that an executive can sit there and say, oh, okay, I can actually start to, to So I wanted to start with giving a few definitions. Um, I mean, these are basic, but I just want to make sure that we're sort of on the same page, so you're understanding what I'm saying. But that's what the definitions are all about. And some of these things do differ mm -hmm. from situation to situation. So I'm just going to run through these kind of quickly. So the servers are hardware. The environment is 
everything required for a service to execute, all of the dependencies that need to exist on a server. So that's broken down here into um, three different types of environments. So you have a bare metal environment, for instance, the server OS, the ecosystem, the service, the uh, virtualized uh, type of environment, hypervisor, VM, we know this stuff, right? Just go into container office, because this is where it gets a little new, so it's important to come back to our definitions. Server operates as an ecosystem container service. And I'll get into what containers are, because that's a new concept for you, but I think a lot of you have seen this. So. Uh, virtual machine, we know what that is. Ecosystem. Ecosystem is just talking about the set of tools, utilities, and agents that you need to be able to support some service that you're running. The service is the piece of functionality that's actually supporting the business logic. So, services, you know, application services. These are the things that directly contribute to uh, being able to execute the business logic. This would be the functionality that you're selling to people. Uh, platform services are things that sort of live a, la a layer beneath that, but they are their own discrete services. So block storage, load balancers, message queues, they're a means to an end, but they're not directly uh, contributing to the, to the actual functionality. Infrastructure services much more tangential type of a service that's used for monitoring, log aggregation, provisioning, all those sorts of activities. Developer services. Uh, well, this is your build server, the Jenkins account, Strano, your way that you're building the developing and getting out the production. Okay. Well, the labor definition they want. This is our first egregious diagram. What uh, so what we're seeing here, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over this twice, so maybe that makes it clearer. So um, the first time, let's, I'll just follow it through the path of a request that's coming into the system and some of the things that are happening as it flows through and then a response comes out the other end. In the following slides after that, we'll dig into the specific bits of functionality that flow through in more detail. So the internet is uh, depicted in here as a red cloud. Uh, it's red for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's red because our legend down below says it should be red because it's public DMZ, but it's also red because red is a sign, it's a, it's a signal of danger, and that's what that is. The internet is the biggest security threat to your, your network. You know this. Um, and so we use the red lines to indicate where the, uh, the, the, uh, the services are that are listening, that are exposed to uh, requests directly from the internet haven't been sanitized or any firewall or any other services before getting to them. So it's very important to identify those in your network because those are the, your main attack points that have to be really, really well secured. And those lines there technically wouldn't have to be read. It's possible you could architect the thing differently so it's just the load balancers and the DMV or something. But this way I think it just shows the point a little, a little more illustratively. So the request comes in through the internet, goes to the load balancer. What the load balancer is doing in this situation is it's using situational awareness that it has about the different servers that are running, the server, uh, the, server the service containers that are running on top of it, and what resources those service containers are currently utilizing. Based on that information, it's able to decide, for instance, if the request is user login. <coughs> we have two instances of user login that are running across two servers. It's going to route that request to the container instance that is using the fewest resources at this time. From those CPUs that we're having there. So they would say it gets routed down to server two. If server two is handling that login request, then in order to do that, it needs to get information from the identity management system on the back end. So it's going to, take, it's going to construct a reasonably generic type of a request message. It's not something that is specific to that particular brand of identity management system. Instead, it's something probably that, that you've defined as, as a way that your topology is going to communicate. Creates that message and puts it on a message bus right here down the center. The message bus then uh, makes it available to anyone who is listening for messages of that type. In this case, uh, types, or I'll go ahead and use the, uh, the product term as topics, a topic would be created that represents each discrete type of service that exists that's connected to that bus. So we would add a command to the identity management topic that would then be consumed by the identity management server. It knows how to 
interpret that message, execute the request, and then return the response back on the topic of the service that initially issued the request. So it says, hey, I'm a user login, and in management, I make this guy valid, and if he says, hey, it is, it puts it back on user login's topic so they can consume that. Uh, presumably, it, you know, it tokenizes uh, what it needs to tokenize, and then uh, sends that response back out through the internet uh, back to users, and then we can continue on with the session. Some other uh, notable mentions on this <coughs> diagram are this piece here. So what's being described here is the idea of being able to retrofit an existing service which doesn't natively support a message bus, but adding an adapter so that you can uh, en enable it to be able to communicate on the bus. And I'll explain why we want to do that in just a moment. So, but it's important to know that we can. The cloud controller down here at the bottom is doing a couple of things. So in, uh, it's responsible for provisioning the different service containers that we see across each of the services. But it's also got its own little connection to the bus. And so does the monitoring service. And we have agents. So there's also a cycle of information going on between the monitoring agents reporting usage of resources back to the monitoring service. At specific intervals or when configured thresholds are met, then the monitoring service will send events down to the cloud controller and says, hey, you've exceeded the uh, resource threshold for you know, messages get reset. And the cloud controller can say, okay, yeah, we need to instantiate another instance of that container and it has a different level of awareness across these servers. It's not, it's not looking at resource, like real-time resource utilization at a given time, but it's looking at resource allocation. Because each one of these as service containers that are running are going to consume some defined amount of resources when they start. So they'll uh, say if they define user login and said, I need um, 500 megs of RAM or something like that, or four gigs of memory, whatever, and uh, I need two CPU cores. So that amount of resources, just like a virtual machine, would be reserved for it. So that's what the cloud controller is keeping track of. So based on the known uh, allocation of resources to the containers that are uh, provisioned on each one of those servers, and knowing the total amount of resources available on the servers, it can find the best place to instantiate the container that you're asking. Having the, the server X, is that the implementation of the bus, essentially? I think that's what you said. I just wanted to make sure. You're talking about the white line down the middle here? Right. A, a, a message, a, a, everything else is very detailed, but the bus seems very hand wave. Yeah. Right. So uh, so there is an actual server that is that's operating this bus, or a series of servers called brokers. And so we'll dig into that in a little detail, but you're right. They're not pictured here. Okay. Conceptually, the, the, if you look at it, Message bus has been around a long time. I mean, this is not meant to be like, oh, this is a brand new thing you've never heard of. You know, I get it. Message bus has been around for 10 plus years. And they're usually depicted in a manner kind of like this, with a big thick line with, with um, these, these balls on either end. But um, what's interesting about this is the way that the message bus is being used. It's being used in some ways that are a little different than what we've seen in the past. It's not about the, the typical use case when we're to ask you, do I need an enterprise service? Okay, we have a bunch of heterogeneous systems that are really different that you need to interoperate in some standardized way. Uh, if the answer is yes, then we probably do. If not, then well, maybe you can look at something else. Maybe you just need a queue or something similar. Um, in this case, we don't really have that situation going on. We can have uh, services that are maybe brand new, freshly built, that are made to work with this bus, so that's not what we're getting out of it. But I'll go through. When we get to the, the specific slide, we'll go through several different key advantages to doing it this way. Bitcoin might. 
mining process now and you know whatever also. Yeah. So a lot of people will just have that completely physically isolated because also it has different bandwidth requirements. So you may have you know big fat 10 gig ports all over the place for your production infrastructure. The management doesn't need that much. So you get a cheaper uh, one gig switch and use that to manage uh, that too. So that also helps with segregation. But the other piece of it is your public DMZ versus your backbone VLAN. So that's often done through software configuration, or at least in this model of software configuration. Uh, using that method, you can you can accomplish VLANing through two main ways. One is by having an SDN controller that can connect into your router directly or your switch directly, and then actually just automate the allocation of VLAN, uh, the VLAN addresses across each one of those ports. Or it can work purely at the software level, which would be managing the network configuration of each of the containers and managing which adapters those containers map to and using that to be able to segregate which thing appears to be on which subset. The good thing about that slide is really that most of that is, is all available today and anybody who's looking uh, going down the open stack route or something like that, that's, that's those are native OpenStack concepts, so you don't necessarily have to get all the way to an application container infrastructure to be able to take advantage of that. So, microservices. So this is something that just sort of we'll breezed over and didn't really get into when we're going through it. But you notice the services that were defined on each one of those servers had very specific URL paths associated with them. It wasn't like that was just saying, uh, this is the process that handles all my web service calls, and then inside of that, I'm going to have a big slew of methods that are all dealing with each one of these requests that are coming in. So the thought process here is about identifying what is your base unit of scalability. What is the, the fundamental resource, uh, resource usage model or characteristic, maybe is the word I'm looking for? Resource, resource characteristic uh, of a service running in your network. So, so since no two web service methods consume exactly the same resources, you can assume the worst case scenario. So what, we're, what this is talking about is if you're capacity planning and trying to figure out, okay, how many servers am I going to need to be able to support some traffic model that I've, I've uh, determined is going to be in you know, yeah, X number of simultaneous requests during these hours, and a spike, and this, and blah, 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 and I can handle this thing per second, then, uh, then you start to draw out, okay, here's the thing what you need. If you have all of these web service requests lumped into the same service that's handling all of them, then you're sort of beholden to, it's a little bit common denominator problem, you're beholden to the service request that uses the most resources and is the slowest. You don't have any way to break that guy out, give him some more horsepower by itself, and then let the others you know, just fall with all the chips they fall. So that's what this is getting at. Okay, here are back to service bus. So what we're doing here is several different things. The first is connection level decoupling. So this is a traditional service bus concept that, that we would have seen you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, but it's important to, to bring it up here so that as opposed to the alternative, which is directly connecting each of our services to one another, if I wanted to make some pretty radical change and change out significantly the implementation of a given backend service, it'd be really difficult. I mean, that happens to look at that and say, okay, well, who are all, what are all the services that are connecting to it? Well, those all need to have different providers changed out, and da 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 all sorts of things have to be rolled into place to be able to make that happen using the service bus abstraction adapter, but otherwise none of the other consumers of that service should be affected. That's also really great if you have the host state of providing anything blank as a service. You want to have something like this so it gives you that flexibility without impacting an unknown number of consumers that you don't even control. Uh, that was a common consistent mechanism. Now this is, this is the key. The key is right here in the second point is the the issue that a lot of running into, I personally run into it for sure, in the data center, when you have a significant, at least a, a complex enough service.
service that you're providing, if you have a series of back-end services that are supporting that API, figuring out, first of all, okay, you can do load testing, figure out the performance, figure out the bottlenecks, but then what do you do about it? How do you scale some arbitrary piece of functionality that somebody wrote in Java and you know, they started with you know, socket.listen, zero, 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 of course. And, you know, and, and it's, just, it's just something really arbitrary. Uh, in order to scale that, it's going to be largely dependent on, well, what did you do? Did you, did you try and just do people? I mean, can you do people multiplicated in a multi-master scenario? Or did you implement your own sort of uh, state synchronization logic? Or who knows what, right? It, it's, so what this is getting at is being able to provide a common language and a common story and utility for providing that fault tolerance, scalability, and load distribution mechanisms. Uh, and just that added benefit, we do also, uh, one of the tools chosen here, get a standard way of parallelizing tasks, which can be really helpful at times. And that's purely done through, uh, through configuration. So when uh, a particular consumer joins the bus, it can choose how it wants to handle her uh, or how to handle the messages that are put on the bus, whether it wants to uh, just hand them in a round robin fashion along with any other consumers that are listening to that same topic, or does it want to get a copy of everything? And then at that point, you need to uh, have some sort of negotiation to make sure that your service is going to work, but, uh, but it gives you a mechanism to, to get that done in a predictable way. The resource monitoring, I've already mentioned that a couple of times because it's, it's really key to being able to, work, to deliver on this promise of elastic scalability. You can <laughs> hear it in, over and over again, I'm sure your boss is tapped on the server at some point, like, it needs to be elastically scalable. I don't know what that means, but you know, it needs to scale. Uh, well, okay, well, let's think about that for a minute. We can do it, right? But in order to accomplish it, it's going to have to be a joint effort between IT and engineering to make it happen. What IT can do, at least from our perspective, is to say, uh, here's a set of primitives. We've already walked through uh, how we're going to get you messages through the message bus. We're going to monitor the resource this way. Uh, and the resource monitoring we use can vary. And that's not even the key point, is that you have something that is monitoring the resource on all the servers at all times. And it has some things to then be able to alert a cloud controller function that can then do something about it if uh, we do start to see uh, some of these big regressions. Application containers. If you haven't seen this kind of stuff before, is there anybody that's new to application containers that has like never, never really played with Docker and hasn't seen anything? Do you think okay? So, let me flip ahead one slide and then I'll come back. I know that's sort of a no-no in presentations, but I don't really think there's a better way to both show you the text and the image or something like this. What we're looking at here is from the left to the right a time a chronological evolution of the way that uh, application stacks have been deployed in order to be able to achieve various levels of scalability. So starting at the very beginning, we're talking about LAMP stacks back in 1999. Sort of Apache on a server, but PHP had something on it, and off we went. Then virtualization came along and we said, okay, well, you know, that's probably not the best idea. We're spending a lot of money on the servers, they're kind of everywhere. And um, and this weren't commodity servers either. It's still <coughs> reasonably easy server hardware. And uh, we could just really spend a little bit more to build a bigger server and be able to run off of these things on the same hardware. So um, that's where virtualization came along. We had server hypervisor, virtual machines. Each one each virtual machine contained a complete operating system, each of the servers. Containers. Containers the idea that, okay, that's great that now we have virtualization, but is it overkill? I mean, do we need separate instances of the operating system? I mean, if you're in a situation that's just wild west uncontrolled and then you don't you have services running on lots of different operating systems or something and it has lots of different dependencies, well virtualization is definitely your best bet. But uh, if we've reached either a level of maturity within the product development or we have the luxury of being able to start something pretty new, 
these slides are available online as well. If you want to uh, have them on now or later, you can get back to that. So I don't spend a lot of time doing all the slides. So the cloud control, so it's, it's, it's a good segue. So we've covered all basically the prerequisite technology. The controller is now the brain of this thing. It's the one that's keeping track of where stuff is and the inventory of services. How many of I, I, this, is a, this is a real question. I, I just, I'm curious to know how many of you, if somebody came to you and asked you, what's running on every server in your data center right now? Can you show us? Who could do that? Ah, awesome. <laughs> really small. <laughs> so that's oh, a, a sorry, part of uh, when you ask that question, you're talking about uh, how long would it take to process that request? Like, in other words, do I have a tool that would enable me? Application or service? Sure. Do you? Can you do that? Depends on the application. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're running multiple different uh, types of applications within the overall environment, and it depends on the service that you're looking for. Some they they you know, evolve what the tools have developed in that particular tool set, so it needs to be that. So, okay, we know it's not so much. Yeah. This is actually one of the things.
system always has, except it doesn't, you don't configure it with a set of resource pools. You don't say, uh, you know, for this particular service that's identified by this kind of request, here's a pool of IPs that you can round off in order to and send the request to. Instead, it starts with no function at all. It's just, it's just sitting there. When a server comes online and instantiates that agent, the agent then proactively reports back to the load balancer and says, hey, I'm here and I have these resources. That gives, that puts the load balancer in a position to be able to make some choices as well. And so it can work in, in such concert with the cloud <coughs> controller that some people even just marry them onto the same box. Um, so it's, in this case, the load balancer that we're going to talk about, the job model, sneak peek, it's actually a surprise, surprise. Uh, it's rest of rare. Um, it's actually not. Uh, So being rest aware, uh, giving the rest aware service tooling means that it's able to complement what we were doing with those microservices. So breaking down our web service requests so that we have an individual, uh, individual service that's handling each uh, unique URI path that's being called, that is then reflected here with the functionality of the load balancer to be able to read that URI and associate that with a resource pool that was dynamically built based on this running on which servers. And then uh, the I paused for a minute there because it, it's actually a little bit complicated, but I was going to save that complication. So just going to go back to the actual file. All right, so here, here's my approach to staff at um, a generic application. This is, some, this is a web service that's running. It could be you know, service that's running on JBoss or something if you like, or Comcast, if you prefer. It has, uh, it's instantiated with an ecosystem. The ecosystem is running on a virtual machine, which uh, has been set up an operating system, and then those are then uh, coupled onto a server. So we have uh, our beautiful red cloud again, is sending requests into the system. The load balancer is pre configured with the IP address of the virtual machine that hosts the web service. So all the web service requests are going to the same pool of resources. It'll distribute those in a round robin manner. Then the interesting part on the back end here is we don't have a service bus now. And of course we could. Some of these technologies can have CVP scales, not saying they can't. But in this scenario, we don't have them. So we, the alternative is this. We have to reconnect everything to everything. And that in and of itself is not a big deal. It's not going to bog down your network anymore unless you do that. But it's just the management of those connection configurations is what deals with the death by a thousand cuts problem. Um, otherwise, the scenario is about the same. If you want me to dig into that, I think you want to do it with it. All right. So this is the comparison contrast section that I promised you. Capacity planning. This is, I mean, do you guys have some much more effective way of doing capacity planning today than uh, what's described here? I want to hear about it. I mean, I know there's different techniques and different approaches, but I think they all sort of end up somewhere in the same range of sort of hand waving, a little bit of guessing, and some low coming denominator, and divide it out and get it done. <laughs> and that's that's how you do it. Uh, that, if you even, yeah, some people want to come up with a methodology. <laughs> so, takes that out, you know. So, the, so that's the great thing about having the dynamic services is that you don't, <coughs> in some sense, you don't really have the same burden of capacity planning up front because the system can respond to fluctuations in demand. You can just kind of have an unallocated pool. It's just, you know, they can, you know it's just put three or four pool servers there and just, you know, let's see what happens. And it gives you, because usually you're not going to turn on 10 million users on day one, right? The reality is you have a ramp up time, if, even if this is 1.0 version of the product, to be able to get some feel for what's going to happen and where your weakest link is and what things you're going to want to see. <coughs> and so that's sort of what I'm driving to here. It's just a little uh, experimentation phase. You can see based on when you let some load in or you, you drive some, some artificial load into the system which services are starting to, to want to scale out dynamically just all over the place. Well, that's the one you want to focus your attention on. It's, 
it's okay in the sense that you have a system that can deal with that. It'll make the instances and it'll put it across the resources and make sure that you're able to deliver to your customers what they, they want. But uh, at the same time, it, it lets you know, okay, this is where we need to focus our energy because it's probably wrong, especially if it's you know, going out 3x, 4x, 5x beyond what any other service is doing. Probably something we can do in here to improve that either within the code or within the algorithm or something that we're doing. <coughs>
within each pool is load balanced. And so that's the key unique bit about this that provides a lot of additional flexibility, especially if you're in a situation where you need to run uh, a, a variety of different kinds of processing. So you have maybe some light with data processing that needs to happen that um, is part of your actual uh, service delivery flow, which is always a little terrifying. But if it's, if it's reasonable, you can accomplish it through this. Uh, services are defined as topics and mission, blah, blah. that they're 